Welcome to Napa Valley Inside Out. I'm Latif Hasen, and I am delighted to be hosting this podcast, shining a light on one of the most beautiful and coveted lifestyles in the world. If you're interested in developing a property, planting a vegetable garden, making olive oil, fashion, architecture, interior design, county rules and regulations, biking paths, art, getting into the wine business, farming practices, the tax benefits of owning a vineyard, or the ultimate private tours and tastings, and all the fabulous annual cultural events we enjoy here, and so much more, then you won't want to miss this show. Every week I will be interviewing amazing talent, vintners, entrepreneurs, leaders, consultants, festival organizers, and well-known personalities in the Valley. They will share their knowledge, experience, advice, goals, passions, and their best-kept secrets. Hello everybody, today we're joined by Scotty Stark of the Stark Advantage. Scotty is originally from Texas, but he specializes in showcasing Napa Valley by creating extraordinary and coveted experiences that most people don't realize exist. He loves connecting great people with great wine, and he never goes anywhere without his drone. So welcome, Scotty. Thank you. <laughs> Happy to be here. You and I met under extraordinarily funny and unexpected circumstances through our mutual friend, Hollywood Jack. Hollywood Jack. <laughs> who we should say hi to Jack. Hey, Jack. Hey, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, about a year later, we connected and you said, let's have lunch. And uh, I don't normally go out for lunch, but I thought, okay, I'm going to go. And we had lunch and I thought, honestly, who is this guy? Everybody in the restaurant wants to talk to him. There wasn't a table that wasn't getting up to talk to you. You know, the manager came over and I thought, wow, who am I with? I had to pay a lot of people that day. <laughs> that was a really fun day. Oh, it, was it was really fun. fun. I just yeah. uh, tend to be really nice to everybody who I've met in my 15 years in Napa and um, I'll be nice to people. Yeah, I've seen that. I've seen that with you. So you grew up in Texas and you worked in restaurants to pay your way through college. Correct. And you were a mechanical engineer major. Correct. Um, the, jobs, the job offers came in and you weren't interested? I was um, more interested in entertaining people like I was doing, work rating tables and bartending, and uh, was honestly making more money than the offers that were coming in. So. I stuck with the restaurant business and it led me out here. And that was in Houston? That is correct, yes. So you had a really, you had an epiphany one night when you were waiting on a table, um, which really was a turning point in your career. Correct. Tell us about that. Uh, it was a very high end restaurant that had just opened and the uh, wine list was pretty uh, lengthy uh, at the standards of those times and uh, this couple came in in order to several hundred dollar bottle of wine that I had never tasted or been exposed to. And they left a little for me to try after the shift and uh, went back with uh, the wine director at the time and tasted it. And it was like a light came down and I just started saying all of these descriptors that uh, were bouncing in my head. And I had no idea you know, what I was saying at the time. It just happened and he said that I had a really tremendous palate and a great nose for wines and he wanted to promote me into the wine department and that happened the next day. Wow. And do you remember the name of that wine? 1982 Chateau Lynch Bosch. Wow. Do you remember what it cost? Uh, then it was, I think, $490 on the wine list. In 1995? 96. 96. Yes. That was yes. a lot of money back then. That was a lot of money back then. <laughs> so, yeah. so you've got an expensive palate. <laughs> <laughs> or they did. <laughs> well, that's the problem when you're in the wine industry here or you live here. And I mean, I represent a lot of cult wineries and, and you do too. And so, I mean, my taste is really, I'm kind of expensive to run these days. Yes. Right? Unfortunately, the, the more expensive wines you taste, it's hard to go back. Right. Right. Um, when you first came to Napa Valley, what were you doing? I, was, uh, moved, I moved out here to open a small winery called Ravana. Um, he was a regular customer of mine at this steakhouse where I was uh, uh, the wine director and became very good friends. So I was uh, employee number two there and uh, kind of had relationships already established because of my position at the steakhouse in Houston. So when I moved out here, I had a lot of friends already. 
And Ravana's a great wine. Yes, it is. Yeah, how long were you there? About three years. And then did you move on to another winery or did you start your own business? I moved on to uh, Fisher Vineyards where mm -hmm. I was employed for about five years. Another great one. Another great one. And then I've reached the cap of where hospitality um, could be paid. And so I decided to branch off on my own and um, start helping small boutique wineries build their mailing list. So that was before you started the concierge services? Correct. Ah, so you have several wineries that you represent. Yes. And how do you represent them? Do you take their wines around the country? I, a few ways. I, I host uh, lunches with people uh, where I can bring specific wines from my portfolio that match their palate and match the food of the place where we're eating. Um, I do also do road shows where I will take uh, a few of my wines on the road and uh, people host me and their friends for these uh, kind of wine Tupperware parties as they're known. And uh, I make a lot of friends and yeah, hopefully do. sell a lot of wine. Yeah. And then uh, got them on the hook for when they come out to Napa to uh, set up arranging um, personalized tours for them. Yeah, so that's, there's a lot of connections made along the way there. Absolutely. Right, yeah. yeah. Now I'm realizing about the lunch we had, yeah. And then you decided to start a concierge service. Is that when you started the, the Stark Advantage? Uh, well, the Stark Advantage existed with the... Uh, uh, the small wineries, but the I was creating these itineraries for people uh, for free, and uh, people just enjoyed it so much and advised me to start charging. And I'm basically just sending people to my friends and other wineries, but then really started to get into the science of interviewing these people to see which wines, if they're their interest, if they're into art, if they're into cars, all kinds of different things to figure out which wineries would be best suited for them to go visit. And how do you select the people you work with or how do they find you and how do you pull this together? Honestly, it's been all word of mouth, which right. is, I think, the best advertising. Um, I don't really uh, advertise much at all. It's uh, people have great experiences and they send me their friends. Right. And you were telling me once that you have everybody fill out a questionnaire. Yes, I saw a very, very thorough questionnaire to figure out their likes, their interests, uh, what price point. That's a very important question that they'd be comfortable with spending. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of restaurants, um, uh, any kind of other experiences that they'd like to do while they're out here. And then you, sometimes they buy a lot of wine, right? Hopefully, yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but not just from the people you represent. They might, you take them to other wineries, which Absolutely. is... Yes. So, so we had a great dinner the other night, didn't we, up at Constant Diamond Mountain yes, Winery? And that was just like, that was really an incredibly special evening. Right. I think everybody's still pretty blown away by it. I absolutely agree. And you have um, quite a few relationships with people that have wineries, beautiful estates like that, where you can take your guests and they can have a dinner or a luncheon, and the owners allow you to do that just to entertain them because you are who you are. It, it took a while to gain the trust, but once they saw yes. that my intentions were um, ideal, then it wasn't very difficult to uh, kind of entertain people at these places. Yeah, because there's so many people who want to have a very special experience. They, you know, they can come and go to all the wineries that everybody can go to, which are, you know, some wonderful wineries, so many wonderful wineries. But to have those coveted experiences that are so memorable, like we had the other night, there are, uh, that you can't get into, Right. That's what you... You can't Google those experiences. You can't Google those experiences, and you can't find them, and you need access through people Correct. like yourself. Yes. Yeah, really, really fun. Um, so tell us about the concierge services. What are all the services that you do? Do you do hotels? Yeah. I uh, basically advise people that you just buy your airline ticket, and I'll take care of the rest. So, oh, that's nice. Uh, car service, uh, hotel, restaurant, reservations, and of course, winery itinerary, spa treatments, um, advice on hiking, um, anything, whatever your interests are, I can uh, find a way to make you happy. Wow, that is a lot of work, actually. It's a lot of work. And I wonder how many, <laughs> how many times they go wine tasting and they want to change their itinerary. Oh, we're not going to make it to lunch. Or, right. Or they're late. Or, oh, they're late. Or no. Oh, yeah. It takes experience in, in setting up times where, you know, little things like that might happen. Uh, so you give, you just learn to create little buffer time slots to fill in in case there's traffic or there's a flat tire or they stayed late with another winery. Uh, but that came with experience. So you must have really close relationships with um, drivers. 
limo drivers. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, yeah. we met, met a great one the other night. It was Tom Jarman. That's correct, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, because the two of you are trying to keep them on track, which I'm sure doesn't happen very often that they're on track. It can be difficult at times um, when, let's just say, the, um, the owner of the winery, if they come out and, uh, let's just say, they happen to be someone somewhat famous or... Uh, they have great interest and you don't want to interrupt their conversation. Right. So you just have to grin and bear it and uh, call the next winery and let them know that it might be running a little bit late. And do you go on all of these these experiences with them? I do not. All oh, right. I okay. just arrange a driving service in their itinerary and um, hope that they stay on track. And keep your cell phone on. Oh, my <laughs> right. God, I can just imagine. Oh, boy. It's, it's babysitting it sometimes, oh. but it's it's absolutely worth it to make people's trips extraordinary. Yeah. Now, do you get to meet many of these people? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yes. that's, that's great. The only time I don't get to meet them is if I'm out of town, but usually mm -hmm. I'll be hosting them at one of my um, uh, wineries that I represent. Yeah. Well, you must be pretty excited about all the hotels that are coming to Napa Valley because of the great experiences that you can, the more experiences that you can Absolutely. provide for your clients. Right. I mean, and you live in Calistoga. Correct. So tell us what you think about what's going on up there. I'm extremely excited about what's up and coming. Uh, we have uh, the Four Seasons coming, and of course we have the Rosewood coming, and there's whispers of a couple of others. We already have um, Solage and Calistoga Ranch and uh, quite a few others. So it's, yeah. an, it's an amazing place yeah. to to visit and it's I think it's uh, quite often forgotten because it's the furthest north in the valley. Yeah and I actually I just sent out my newsletter my monthly newsletter yesterday and I did a little research on what's happening up there so Sam, the owner of Sam's what's the name of that hotel the Sam's restaurant um, Oh, the Indian Springs. Oh, Indian Springs, yeah, completely remodeled. So they own the land next to that, and they're doing a huge another hotel there, which is going to right. be fantastic. Yes. Sounds wonderful. And Rosewood Hotel, which is going to be like the flagship of all flagships. And I know you guys were asking me the other night what's happening, when are, the, when are they going to start building? So I did check with the planning director at Calistoga, the city of Calistoga, and uh, Lynn Goldberg, and she told me they won't be even putting in their plans for building until next year because they are spending a fortune on massive infrastructure way up the hill where you can't see it. They're building 20-foot retainer walls up there, not unlike what they've done down below on that right. incredible driveway. The entrance is superb. How many millions and millions and millions and millions <laughs> is in that driveway? Right. And so there's a lot of that work that has to go on up there. So, um, so that's what's happening with Rosewood, yeah. And that's going, to be, that's going to be their flagship, I think, in the world. Right. Right? That's what I've heard. We're so excited. By the time all of these are finished, there will be more five-star hotels in Calistoga than anywhere else in Napa Valley. It's amazing to think about. Yeah. So that's going to be really fun. And it's so funny because the more they build, the more people come. And right. All year, I'm still hearing, Latif, there's nowhere to stay. There's nowhere to stay. Right. I mean, I'm taking in people all the time. Yeah, yeah because right. it's like you, if you build it, they will come. Yeah. Absolutely. It's been extraordinary. Let's hope so, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so when did you start your own wine, making your wine? This was um, 2012. Um, my, one of my best friends was working at a winery, and uh, he said, hey, I've got opportunity to buy a few barrels of wine if you want to start a wine label together. And I said, absolutely, let's do it. Um, because I have always been asked if I was going to make my own wine, and my answer was always no. Um, because I know what it takes to make wine, and I'm more interested in the sales and marketing side, not the uh, labor-intensive part of winemaking. And so my business partner, he just wants to make it, and I just want to sell it. So he's the chef, I'm the maitre d', and it works out perfectly. Ah, that's wonderful. So you bought the wine at the time that was available that year. Correct. So our viewers would be very interested about to know about this. So you've been making it for how long? Uh, 2011 was our first vintage. We're going to be releasing our 15 later this year. And it's called? Har Harumph. Harumph. Um, so where do you source your grapes from since then? I mean, you obviously were lucky to get those barrels at the Absolutely. time. It's not yeah. easy, and most not every year there's great wine left, right, to buy. Right. So wh how, do you, how do you manage that every year, uh, maintaining the quality? Do you get it from the same We do get source? from the same gross growers. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, St. Helena Cabernet uh -huh. expression, so that is the dominant part of our wine. But I also wanted to, uh, or we wanted to add some mountain fruit, so we added some Spring Mountain Cabernet, and then... Uh, I've always been a fan of the Cabernet from Stag's Leap. So all three S's, Stag's Leap, St. Helena, Spring Mountain, wow. um, are, in, are 
mixed together for our expression of Napa Cabernet. So Valley Floor St. Helena. Correct. Yeah. St. Helena has some amazing Valley Floor cabs, which is interesting because, you know, you generally think of Cabernet, the best Cabernet is being up in the hillsides um, because they stress the vines. But look at Andy Beckstoffer. He's got the most incredible vineyards and they're all on the Valley Floor. He doesn't want anything up in the hillsides. And and, and interestingly, his answer as to why. Yes. Um, Well, that's exciting. So how much are you making? We make uh, now about 400 cases. And how do you sell that? Well, through all the friends that I've kind of and uh, commandeered over the past 25 years of being in the business, I have a, a good relationship with a lot of them, and they were very, very happy to support us. So we sell it mostly uh, to our mailing list and uh, uh, sprinkle a little bit around Napa Valley. There's some great restaurants that feature our wine, yeah. and we are distributed in uh, three states. Fantastic. Are you thinking about expanding and making any more? Hopefully, yes. It's, uh, as I'm sure you've heard, it's a break-even business and it's a yeah. lot of uh, time to commit. But yeah. uh, if we get more, it, it would, uh, I'd have to devote more time and then less time to Stark Advantage. So I think we're at a great balance right now. And it really is just a, it's just a, a break-even, right? Correct. <laughs> Did you hear that, everybody? <laughs> everybody take note that wants to make wine, <laughs> even at 400 cases. You actually have to sell it, and you're not yeah. making any money. The selling's right. a lot of work, right? Selling is a lot yeah. of work. Yeah. Every time somebody says to me, oh, I want to get into the wine business, I say, we need to do coffee. <laughs> <laughs> we need to do coffee. <laughs> so um, what are some of the other things that you put on your itineraries other than wine tasting? I mean, do you, do you meet many people that don't want to do wine tasting? Sometimes, yes. I mean, we're very well known for our spas here. I mean, um, mm-hmm. And uh, there's great hiking, there's boating, there's uh, zip lining if you want it. Of course, there's cooking classes, there's art galleries, uh, there's biking. There's uh, so many things that you can get into here. And everybody wants to do everything, mostly wine t- tours and tastings. But um, every once in a while, yeah, people want to do some different things. And biking. So you've got to organize the biking tours. Correct. The whole, the whole itinerary of the biking. Well, I usually leave that to the... Um, companies that specialize in that. But I will right. refer my clients over to them. Right. And where are the best spas in Napa Valley? Um, my opinion, Solage uh, is one of the best. Mm-hmm. Uh, Calistoga Ranch, uh, Villaggio, even though they're going through a little bit of a renovation right now. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Meadowood. Meritage, Meadowood, Auberge, um, all of them offer. And Indian Springs. I mean, there's, there's so dozens. Many, yeah. What about the, um, the hot springs up there? Do people like the hot springs and the mud baths? They do. They do? They do. Um, I can't get into mud that someone else has been in. I, I agree with you on that. Uh, <laughs> this, the, the mud uh, treatment at Solage is a little bit different, which yeah. I'll talk to you about that. It's, it's amazing. Oh. You'll experience that one. Okay, yeah. okay. And what seem to be the um, most favorite hotels? Solage is definitely one of them. Um, I think that Auberge de Soleil, Calistoga Ranch, Poetry Inn, Bartisano, oh, yeah. Bellagio, Yountville Inn. Um, there, there's just so there's many just great so places. Many. Aren't they great? And, and the Archer now. Todd the Archer. Polsky's the Absolutely. Archer. Mm-hmm. The rooftop. Everybody go down to the rooftop at the Archer. It's pretty yeah. fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that extraordinary? It is. Yeah. Uh, let's see. I wanted to talk to you about um, driving services because when I saw you the other night and Tom Jarman was there, you said you would like to talk about the difference between having a private driver and Uber. So tell us about that. Well, I think um, utmost is is safety. I mean, if you're going to be visiting two to four wineries, Mm -hmm. um, you're going to partake in alcohol. Right. And that's going to have obviously an effect on you. And I think that to enjoy it and be more relaxed, to hire a driver to uh, make sure that your safety is, uh, uh, is kept. And they usually know where all of the wineries are, so you're not lost or looking at a GPS or um, you know, frustrated because you can't find a place and then you're running late. And a driver will usually take all of those um, uh, fears away. Yeah, they're a pro at it. You're saying do, use a driver rather than Absolutely. Uber because, yeah, obviously. Yeah, Uber's getting better here, but um, if you're on a schedule like that I set up, um, it can be 20 to 30 minutes for an Uber to arrive, and of course that's going to set you behind at your next appointment. So um, by the end of the day, I think the driving service, uh, you're going to spend about the same money, maybe a little bit more with the driving service, but you're going to be on time, and um, you're going to have fun. All of the drivers here are pretty knowledgeable, so they can 
entertain and educate as well between the yeah. Uh, visits. Yeah. And it's true, Uber, the Uber drivers don't know where they're going half the time because they're from another area, right? Right. That's right. a really good point. I hadn't thought about that. really makes a lot of sense. Um, let's talk about um, winery etiquette, wine tasting et etiquette. Sure. Um, well, I think uh, one of the things that I advise my clients in coming out is uh, uh, perfume and cologne as one of the things that are kind of frowned upon at wineries. Um, it can interfere with not only yours, but your your friends or even other people at the wineries experience there because they're going to be smelling your cologne or perfume as opposed to what's in the glass. Mm -hmm. I know and you know what most people have never heard of that before but I can tell you that most uh, wineries here in the valley owners, winemakers, people in the serving they they really it's offensive so so tone down or do not wear any cologne or perfume and you know it's interesting because um, I actually learned this the hard way, I'm going to fess up, but many, many years ago I had a huge vineyard for sale and um, I, was, I, I had to race down and do something at the vineyard and uh, I, got a, I got a phone call from a neighbour who just ripped on whoever was in the car. They said, well, maybe it wasn't you, it might have been your assistant. But what happened when you go through the vineyards, all the dust is flying up onto the vines and the, vine, and the grapes are not onto the grapes and the grapes are not washed before they're before the wine is made. So when you're driving through the vineyards, drive very, very slowly. And even when you do that, there'll still be a little bit of dust. But if you have your foot on the gas pedal, you're not going to be um, Very welcome. well received. Yeah, you will not be right. well received. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, the other thing too, I learned years ago, also guilty. I don't know why I could be so stupid, but I was. I lived in the vineyards and I'd go running every day in the vineyards and in summer if it was if I was hot or thirsty I I would just grab a few grapes off the vines and <laughs> I can't believe I'm saying that. I'm not gonna tell you where I did it. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? It's grand theft. It's grand theft. And in fact I looked it up on Google as well. Um, if you were to steal a four hundred dollar four hundred dollar um, iPhone it's not grand theft, but if you take a small amount of any produce, much less than $400, it's grand theft, especially in California. So, good to know, right? Good to know. <laughs> okay, let's see what else we've got here. Um, what, what, about, um, what about tipping? So, before we get to tipping, when you go to a um, expensive winery where it's, t it's by appointment only, um, and of course the staff have to be there and they set it up and there's a little bit of tasting of food, or etc. It's quite, it's quite a, an experience and you, you're always charged for that. What is expected of, uh, what do the wineries expect of the people coming? How much wine should we buy? That's a great question and it depends on the guest that's out. There's some guests that just want to come out and have all these great experiences and maybe pick up a bottle or two along the way and that's great but we are in the business of selling wine and so typically for the kind of experiences that I um, procure uh, six to twelve bottles per couple at each winery is appreciated. Uh, the tipping part is not necessarily so much anymore, but it's, yeah. it's generally, it's, it's obviously appreciated. But uh, at the higher end wineries, I think that just the, the purchase of the wines is going to make them happy enough. Yeah, I think what I've always told people is <laughs> if, you are not if you are not going to be wanting to spend 150 200 250 plus dollars um, on a bottle of wine, you probably should not be tasting wines at those places. Um, and if you just want to get, if you don't, if you want to buy six or 12 bottles, great, go for it. Because they spend a lot of time um, doing the tasting with you. And, but if, you, if you're not going to be buying a lot of wine, you're better off going to a winery that's public tours and tastings. And there's so many great ones of those with very, very good wines. Absolutely. You know? Um, and then you're, it's, it's not like that you have a dedicated staff member spending an hour or two with you. Right. You know? Yeah. Um, so the tipping is not necessary. I think that's great. I think sometimes... If you have the best time of your life and yeah. you feel like you need to, then by all means, it's definitely going to be appreciated. But I don't think it's something that's um, it's mandatory. And I know all my fellow friends are going to hate me for saying that. But I think that we're out really to just show people a great time and introduce them to great wines. Uh, if a tip happens, great. If it doesn't, it's not going to ruin my day. 
Yeah, yeah. And you have a lot of great relationships with, you know, Jodie McKenzie and, you know, up at Constant Winery or Dariush you, and, and Dana Estate. So you guys are all sharing clients and sending to each other and supporting each other. It's actually something that's pretty surprising to people how open book we are and how often we share our great clients with other wineries. Uh, people aren't just coming out to experience one wine two times a day for three days that they're going to be out here. Right. So we uh, and myself uh, like to share other wineries that we think would be good fits for our clients. Yeah, I saw that collaboration the other night up at Constant Winery. It was fantastic. Um, so tell me, um, do you think, you mentioned to me the other night that you thought that maybe the tourism had been affected by the fires. Tell we me your thoughts. Oh, crushed. Crushed. Um, September and October are our busiest months in the wine okay. industry. And of course, right. uh, the fire started early October and many, many people canceled their trips through October, November, and even December. Yeah. And uh, of course, the, the media coverage was such that uh, it appeared like we burned down, like there's no more Napa. Uh, but as you know, uh, we are alive and uh, very well and uh, we, need, we need visitors again. Yeah, and you can't tell. I mean, you really can't tell much. Right. when you If you're on the valley floor, the wineries didn't burn, the restaurants are all still here. It's right. really when you go up into the hillside. So yes. that's really the message that we Absolutely. want everybody to come back. Come see us. Yeah. <laughs> but but what are you noticing, though, now in January? Oh, this last six months. We're June already. I was... It's crazy. It's crazy. So tell me what you've noticed. I've actually noticed that people, I can't believe how many people have told me that even straight after the fires, they came up here to support Napa. But what have you noticed this year? I think tourism seems to be pretty strong. We are uh, making a comeback, and those who are yeah. coming out are uh, very happy. Um, even though their neighbors are questioning their trip, thinking that we burned down, um, but everybody is anxious to welcome visitors. So I yes. think the hospitality has had to step up a notch, and uh, I think it's great for the visitors. Yeah, I think you've been traveling around the country and you are realizing that still people think we've still burned out. Correct. That is unbelievable. Yes. The media has a lot to, to... Yes, I want them to come do a positive story about us and how beautiful we, everything still is and hopefully that will happen. Jeez, we, you know what? We should make that a mission to make yeah. that happen. Yeah. Okay, um, let me give that some thought. Okay. Uh, so tell me, um, what is the future for you? Have you any great plans? Oh, you do drones. Tell us about your drones. Yeah, uh, that was a, a, a hobby turned into a small business. Yes. I just bought an inexpensive drone as a toy and started taking pictures and um, posting them on social media. And uh, shortly thereafter, wineries were calling me to come take pictures of their vineyards or... Um, their tasting rooms or things like that and so it kind of just blossomed into a another business now I do real estate and I do events and uh, photography just it's a new dimension in uh, seeing the valley from 200 feet above and I love it it goes with me everywhere I pull over and I know yeah I know the other night I couldn't believe oh, it right. at the constant diamond mountain winery right oh my god the setting up there in the sunset it was just like it's I don't beautiful. think anybody put their camera away for six hours right. that night <laughs> but you just whipped out your drone mm -hmm. and off it went, and it was, oh, I can't wait to see that. It's gorgeous. With the, the shots came out really well. And I've been doing it for four years now, so um, a couple of uh, trees got in the way of my first drones, but uh, <laughs> we fixed that. And, uh, and okay, how many drone. drones have you had? Four. Oh, my God. <laughs> That is so but funny. We're constantly upgrading, so I'm getting better and better drones every time. Oh, well, I saw that one the other day. I can't yeah. believe how far they go out. Oh, I want to see that footage. Okay. That's going to be awesome. Yes. Um, any other plans for the future? Anything up your sleeve? Uh, no, not really. Everything is, I'm very happy with everything that I'm doing right now and uh, making people happy is what I really like to do. So as long as I'm doing that, I'm gonna keep where I'm at. Yeah, because you don't just love introducing great people who love great wines, uh, you know, having them meet. You also love teaching people about wine. Certainly. Yeah, so how does that work for you? Uh, I, I love it. There's so many, gosh, it's such an amazing topic that the more you learn, the more you realize you don't know. Oh. I've been in the business 25 years and I don't know much. I know, it's so um, funny we all say that. Right, and it's, it's just fascinating to share and um, kind of demystify the, the magic that goes into it and let people know how special wine is, how many hands touch that final 
that final product is really mesmerizing. Yeah, and you know what's really wonderful? People who really love wine love great food, and they just go together. Absolutely. Like we, we, you know. Wine is food. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It has been so wonderful having you on the show. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so Absolutely. much Pleasure to be for here. coming. It's Certainly. fantastic. Yes. And you're doing such a great service for people, you Thank know, you. because a lot of people don't have time to organize things. So for them to come up, have a phenomenal experience, right. and then to go away and be raving about Napa Valley and Scotty Stark <laughs> and the Stark Advantage, yeah, which is all, it's all good. I, I did want to mention uh, the name of my wine, Harumph, which yeah. was inspired by a gentleman's birthday who was, whose was yesterday, Mel Brooks. He turned a, a young 92. Oh um, so, hey Mel, happy birthday. Happy birthday, <laughs> Mel. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you very yeah much. it's a great wine. Thank you. Great wine. Yeah. Thank you.